Good morning, Unity East. How's everybody this morning? <laughs> That's great. Um, today is the third Sunday of Advent. Can you believe that already? Wow. Time really flies when you're having fun. Um, today, our minister is Reverend Amina Cope. Remember, she's small but mighty. <laughs> Our pianist, of course, our very talented Marina Kupaka. And today we have a little special thing. We've got two of our um, congregants that will be entertaining us a little bit later. Um, right now, would you like to turn to opening hymn number one? Praise God, the good is everywhere.
Um, now, if everyone would turn to hymn 276 in the hymnal, Behold the Star. <coughs> We'll sing both verses.
inside, a statement of being. We'll read this together. God is all, both invisible and visible. One presence, one mind, one power is all. This is one that is all, is perfect life, perfect love, and perfect substance. I am the individualized expression of God. I am ever one with this perfect life, perfect love, and perfect substance. Can we ever be 
without God. I mean, you see, you see in movies or you might even hear somebody say, oh, God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? No, that never happens. That does not happen. Now, we may turn our backs on that power and presence, but that power and presence is still there, just waiting for us to reopen ourselves to it, to our true nature. And it goes on to say, as we arrive at this midpoint of Advent, the Advent journey, our Advent journey, this is a journey for us to move from hope and faith to recognizing peace begins with us, to knowing that we are love, and to be that love that the world needs now. I just sang a song. <laughs> <laughs> what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Ain't it the truth? It really does. And how does it get there? Right through us. We are the presence and power of love. And in the booklet it says, love is not a feeling, but a principle. It is the essence of our being. And if we look at the Bible, one of my favorite passages is from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And you know what? If you take that passage and, and apply it, because that's what we do in unity. We take all this stuff that we read from the Bible and we read from our booklets and we read from the daily word and we apply it. So if you apply those words from Corinthian and you're out shopping and you're on your way to the mall which is, or whatever your favorite store might be and the, the traffic to get there is crazy and the parking lot is full and you can't find a place to park and then you get inside and the lines are long and you couldn't find what you were looking for but you settled for something else and the price was too high and <laughs> then what? Do you get irritable? Hmm. What does that say? Love is not irritable. It is not resentful. That person stole my parking lot. There was one right there and I was waiting for it. And then they just drove right up and took it from me. But, you know, maybe they had a baby to carry. Or maybe they had a handicap sticker and they couldn't use it because all the handicap spots were full. Should you be resentful? Is that the most loving thing you can do? And I, everybody's read The Prophet, right? I, this, this book, actually, the, is, is from 1970 through the property of Tom J. Coke. Oh. And that's uh, Mike's brother who we lost a number of years ago. But, in this book, the prophet is asked to speak to the people. And what is the very first thing that they ask the prophet to speak about? Any guesses? Oh, yay! You guys are good. And it's actually, if you read this passage on love, it's really not the most uplifting thing that you're ever going to read about love. However, the part that I'd like to share with you today is this passage. When you love, you should 
cannot say, God is in my heart, but rather, I am in the heart of God. And you know those I am statements are so powerful. When you put the two words I am in front of anything, you give that so much power, especially if you speak it out loud. So when you say, I am so upset right now, you give that upset a lot of power. And that's why we watch, and I forgot to bring my water, but sorry. Um, that's why we watch what we say. You know, and where, where do those words come from? Mm -hmm. Our thoughts, right? And not just our thoughts, our feelings. Because upset is, is not really a thought, now is it? Upset is like, you know, you, you can feel, your, you know, you, you get a little tense and, and maybe your brow wrinkles and, and you, you just, you can feel upset, right? And that is our clue. I mean, when things happen that are less than wonderful, they're not there to hurt us. Those events are there to help us, truly. Which is, you know, that's, that's a pretty tough thing for a lot of people to accept. Bad things happen to me, what do you mean? God's mad at me. I'm being punished. What did I do? I've been good. No, it's not a punishment. It's there so that we can learn. We have, we are in this human experience. This is this is a temporary situation that we're in right now. You know, we're, we're, we were all born. You wouldn't be here if you were never born. And we're all going to pass one of these days. We're going to make our transition. However, that presence and power that lives within us, that's always been there as us. Individualized expressions of the divine. Not, not just everything. We are not everything. We are an individualized expression of God, of that one presence and power. And as individualized expressions, we have always been. And now we are individualized as, as Carrie, as Carol, as Rhonda. We are individualized expressions for the time being. And in this expression, we are given opportunities to make the world a better place. That's why we're here. I mean, we're, yes, we are here so that we can be happy, so that we can grow, so that we can have, we can, we can be, do, and have everything we want in life. However, we don't just do it for us. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. And how does it get that love? Through each individual. I mean, we might get some love through our pets. But they don't have they don't have the powers that we do. They can't think like a human being. They don't get the choice to be loving or not loving. You feed a dog or a cat, they will love you. <laughs> and even, you know, that's that's how they tame wild animals. With love, with care, with with treating them well. We have the choice, however. That's what makes us unique in this universe. We are, we don't, we can choose to not be loving. We can receive a gift and say, hmm, that's not what I wanted. Or we can receive a gift and not even realize it is a gift. Like those challenging situations that we find ourselves in. Those are really gifts. And I think one of the reasons that love is so hard to define 
as, as United States citizens is because we have one little four-letter word and we try to describe this massive, huge thing that is probably really indescribable. You know, in Britain, the ancient Greeks said there are eight different kinds of love. And every one of them, except one, with the exception of one, shows us the good part of ourselves. And, and what I considered, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the Greek names because I don't know how, but I can tell you what they are. Self-love. And since peace begins with me, love begins with me, it all begins with me, guess what? Out of all of the kinds of love that there are, that self-love is the most important. And that's not being selfish to love yourself. To love yourself means that when you screw up, yes, you, you don't beat yourself up. When you screw up, you look at it and you go, hmm, I didn't do that as well as I would like to. Look, I, I just am not happy with the way Anita responded in that situation. Boy, do I have to do that from time to time. But instead of, and it's okay, I mean, you're not going to, the difference between pretending that everything's okay and noticing that what you did was not okay and then making amends for that, either with yourself or maybe with another person, that's the difference in being loving or not loving. We can't. We cannot hide from those feelings of upset, but we can look at those feelings of upset, those feelings of irritation, those feelings of whatever that is that we would put in the in the negative category. But it's not really negative. It's really an opportunity for us to be more, for us to learn more, for us to look and find the love. And you know, that's one of the things that we do in unity. We look for the good, even in the tough situations. And that's what separates us from the animals and even from a lot of other religions. Because we're not, we're not looking down on ourselves. We're not, we're not imagining that there is some presence and power outside of us looking down on us and judging us. We are saying we are individualized expressions of God. And as individualized expressions, we are made of love. And if we find ourselves not being loving, then that's our opportunity to say, what can I do differently next time? Playful love. It's the kind that happens when you're just having fun. You know, and I honestly, I love to have fun. I, um, I'm a little bit sarcastic, and so kind of take it as, I, as if I'm being mean. Sometimes I just, and pour my pee gets the burn of it. <laughs> what can I say? I love it. <laughs> and then there's romantic love, which we, and that's a wonderful feeling when it goes the way we want it to. And it can also be a heartbreaking feeling when it doesn't. And then there's affectionate love. And that's the kind of love that you feel towards your, your friends, the, the, everybody in this church. We, we love one another in a familial, family, friendship kind of way. And then there's the actual family love and agape love. Now next to self-love, I would say agape is, is right up there. Because that's the unconditional love. That's the love that says, they stole my parking spot, they probably need it better than I do. They probably need it more than I do. They've got something going on. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stay in that. 
Merry Christmas. I'm glad you got a nice parking spot. I'll just circle around again. The sun's out for a change, or whatever it happens to be. You know, we get to choose how we respond to whatever situation we find ourselves in. And then the, the one that's not so wonderful is that love that leads us to be jealous or whatever. So we'll just kind of push that one aside. I mean, when it comes up, notice it. Notice it. But then you can say, no, I'm not choosing that one. I'm going to choose to go back to the agape, the unconditional love. And then there's that love that's enduring, that develops over time. I mean, the love that power and presence has for us is enduring love, because it is the love that has always been, is now, and will always be. And we can develop that love for ourselves. You know, I think when we were all born, we probably had no problem loving ourselves. I mean, if we, uh, if we were hungry, we cried, we made a fuss, and we got fed. If we needed to be changed, we made a fuss, and they, we got changed. I mean, babies don't dislike themselves when they, if they are learning to walk and they fall down. They don't, they don't go, oh man, I'm never going to learn this walking stuff. <laughs> you know, and so, but we get to a point sometimes where we, we think we're not good enough. We're not, we're not worthy. But we are so worthy. And that's all that that presence and power wants us to recognize is our own self-worth. Because as individuals, how much more worthy can you be than to be an individualized expression of all that is? Does it get any better than that? I don't think so. So, the, one of the things that it said in today's Daily Word that I wanted to focus on is that love is also a call to action. And that brings me to my Christmas story about a young woman by the name of Heather. And she was a single mother. She became a single mother just, just before her fifth child was born. Because her husband decided that Five was just one too many, and he just walked out the door one day and never came back. And it took her a while to figure out that he wasn't coming back. But after the baby was born, he had left them. They had a little bit of a nest egg. I mean, they were in a rented home, but then you know, the rent was paid, and, and he'd left a little money in the bank, so I guess he wasn't completely <laughs> um, anyway, so he was gone, and, and she finally went, okay. So here she is, and, and uh, by this time, a few months had gone by, and, and we, the youngest one was, was getting to the age where he was, slept through the night, and um, the old one wasn't old enough to, you know, take care of the other kids. So she, anywhere she went, the kids went too. And she, but she knew she had to find a job because the money was running out and, and it, was, it was time. You know, she needed to keep the roof over, over their heads and food on the table and, you know, she had to survive. So she packed all the kids up, then all cleaned up, shined up, and, and packed them and loaded them in the car. She had an old, old rusty Chevy. And it ran. Ran well. Didn't look the best, and the tires were down to pretty shiny tires, but you know, got her around. And she was in a small town in southern, in southern Indiana. And so she started off with the little industrial park because she figured that's where she would make the most money. You know, she worked in any shop, she you know, learn any skill, she could she could do it. She was determined. She went to every single shop there was. No takers. So then she thought, okay, how about retail? They always need retail people, right? 
So she went to every retail store that she could find. Put her application in, and a few of them took her application, but nobody offered her a job. So now she's found at the restaurants. And so she started going from restaurant to restaurant to restaurant. She did this, I mean, hours on end. So she'd been looking and looking and looking, and she finally found this little restaurant a few miles out of town. And it was um, actually a, a restaurant, but it was a truck stop. It was not too far off the interstate. And so the kids were getting a little antsy, and they really wanted to go home. But she left the kids in the car, and, and said, you'd be good, not you. Mommy will be right back up. So she goes inside, and and um, she finds the owner, it's an older lady by the name of Marco, and Marco keeps looking out the window and seeing all the kids in the car, and Heather's thinking, oh man, she's like some terrible mother, but that's what I've been doing. And after talking for a while, Marco looks at her and says, well, you know, we're open 24-7, and if you can be here from 11 o'clock at night till 7 o'clock in the morning, you can start tonight. And she said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I mean, it was her last hope. So she, she runs back out to the car, and she tells the kids, great news, money, got a job. Everybody's all happy and excited. She goes home, and she stops at the neighbor's house, who happens to have a teenage daughter well, an older teen who goes to community college during the day, but she lives at home, and so she makes a deal with, with the parents and the mom. They think they, I mean, the parents and the daughter, they know each other, and they know what her what Heather's situation is. So they agree that Heather will get the kids fed and in bed. Everybody sound asleep by the time. The teenager comes over and to watch them, to just sleep on the couch while the kids sleep. So, and then in the morning, if, if they wake up, she'll, you know, give the baby a bottle or pour some cereal into the bowl for, for the kids. So it's, it's a big deal, and, it, and it's something Heather can afford. So she goes off to, to work. And she's, she's happy, and, you know, she's not making a ton of money, but she's paying the rent, she's putting food on the table, everything's getting done, she's getting, you know, she's doing okay. Um, but then Christmas rolls around, it's Christmas season rolls around, and, you know, there's enough money to pay the rent and put food on the table, but there ain't much beyond that. And so Heather goes through the, the older kids' toys that they've kind of outgrown. And when, they act, when, when they're in bed, but she hasn't gone to work yet, she spends some time cleaning them all up and, and shining them up. And, and then she starts wrapping them up for the younger kids. And she was able to squeeze a, just a little bit of money out to go to the Salvation Army and pick up a couple of things for the older boys. She had actually had four boys and, and one girl. And, you know, she knew they needed, they really needed clothes. They needed, they needed jeans and shirts and stuff to wear to school, but she's like, that's not what kids want for Christmas. So she decided that she would just focus on the toys. And, you know, the kid gets another patch on his jeans. Well, so he is. So she goes, um, and by, by this time, the, the, the uh, tires on her car are, she has to stop. There's, she has to stop at the service station and get air in the tires on her way to work. She goes to work, and then she has to stop on her way home from work to fill them again so that there's enough air in them for her to get to this service sort of station again in the morning after sitting over, you know, sitting while she's off work. So she comes and she goes to work. It's about this time of year, it's a few weeks before Christmas. And she does her job and she comes out to the car and there's four brand new tires in the back seat. Four tires? 
I mean, that was like, no, 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 nothing. Just four times. So she says, thank you, thank you. And she makes it, she goes to the service station where she usually fills up her tires, and she makes a deal with the, with the owner there to install the tire and in exchange, she's going to clean his office in the, the front room where people walk in. And so she did, and, and you know, she didn't, it didn't really, it didn't even really bother her that it took her two days of her extra spare time to get his office in the front room clean, and it took him about 20 minutes to put the tires on the car. But you know what? It was okay. So she's happy now. She's got new tires. There's toys for the kids. Life is good. She had to work. I mean, they're open 24-7, 365. So she had to work on Christmas Eve. And so she goes to work, and she does her job. It was a good night. She got some really nice tips. She got to know there was a state trooper that came in all the time. She got to know him quite well. There were a few truck drivers that stop there on a regular basis and of course her boss Margo gave her gave her a nice little Christmas bonus. So she was ready to go home and, and really celebrate Christmas. She was even planning on going to the grocery store and buying some extra nice goodies for the for the children for Christmas dinner. This time she goes out to the car and she's got a smile on her face and she opens the door and she looks in the back seat. And it's loaded with gift bags and wrapped boxes. And she couldn't believe her eyes. So she peeked into one of the bags, and it was a pair of blue jeans and a shirt, just the right size for her oldest boy. And she peeked into another one, and it was another blue jeans, a different shirt, the size for her second son. She knew right then and there that this was going to be an exceptional Christmas. No notes, no nothing. She didn't know who it was from, but she had an idea. So she went home and she put all those things under the tree and it was just half the living room was, was filled with presents. And when the kids got up the next morning, it was pandemonium. They were so happy and so excited. Oh, and there were a few grocery bags in the back seat too, with meats and vegetables and fruit and nuts, everything that she could have possibly wanted to have the best Christmas feast ever. And the kids opened their toy. They opened their toys that she had given them, and they liked them. They loved them. They opened the clothes and they thought, well, that's really nice. I've got some new clothes, but you know, kids don't get too excited over the clothes. <laughs> or the socks or the underwear. <laughs> Whatever. But her daughter had a doll, and each of the boys got one of those big Hess trucks. Have you ever seen those? They're, they're like, a, like a semi with with H E S S on the side and each of the boys had a big truck and boy they were just playing playing with those trucks and having such a great time. And the point is that love is a call to action. You know, I'm guessing that the the, the, the truckers and the state trooper, they're not wealthy people. Margo runs a truck stop. She's not a wealthy woman. But you know what? Those people took action. And because they took action, that little family had the best Christmas they ever had in their life. So what I propose that you do this week is be that love. Take action. Use the love that's in you and show it. And it, it doesn't have to be monetary. You can give someone a smile. You can give someone a hug. And there are some people in this church that give 
It's a mighty good house. So during this Christmas season, let's allow love to lead the way in whatever we do. Let's radiate love and show the world that we are what love is. Namaste. And now let's let's take that spirit of love into our meditation. Let's all relax. Let go of the tension. Just feel it leaving your body. And focus on that heart space. That space where love lives. It lives in and through us always there, always available, no matter the situation, no matter the circumstance. Love is what we are. It's who we are. It's all we are. And this time of year, this is our opportunity to take any and all circumstances and see them through the eyes of love. Whenever we look for the good, that's exactly what we find. And if we know that even the challenging situations are meant for our highest good, and we reach for that love that is always there, then our response will be in line, in alignment with that love. Love is all. Love is who we are. And right now, we're just going to sit and bask in the glow of that love as we radiate it from our inner self so let's just take a few moments in silence and feel Spirit, we are so grateful for the love we feel this moment, for the love that's always there for us, for the love that we have the opportunity to share every day. Let us use this third week of Advent, this week of love, to be the most loving that we can possibly be to recognize love in every situation and respond in a way that shows that love. We are so appreciative of this church, of everyone that's here today, of every life that we touch as we move throughout the week. And we are so grateful to know that there is a presence and power living in and through and as us. And that power is love. Amen. Mm -hmm. And let us sing the Lord's Prayer together.
Gary, and that was absolutely wonderful. I love the lights. <laughs> <laughs> we have any visitors today? We're all family? Great. I just want to welcome to anybody that's online that might be watching us. Remember, you're family too, so we're glad that you're here. Um, announcements. Don't forget this Friday is Paul Ritchie, and we still do have some uh, tickets available. Um, the concert is, starts at 7 o'clock, and we'll have our nerves and raffles. Tickets are $20, and of course this benefits our roof fund. Um, we may need some help setting up before the show, and um, selling any tickets that might be, that, that we still might have. Um, please sign up in the book corner. The Christmas Eve service, remember we will not have service on Christmas Day. Our service will be on Christmas Eve at 3 p.m. for carols, cookies, and coffee, and at 3.30 actually starts the candlelight service. Um, Bernie Bowl um, Sunday is January 1st. And Whitestone Sunday is on January 8th. Also, don't forget, kitchen help is always needed and appreciated. And snacks and goodies, the sign-up um, sheet, those are always, always, always appreciated, too. Um, okay, if you'd like to circle up for a piece song, make sure that you move towards the wall so everybody gets a chance. Together, the light of God surrounds us, the love of 